I'm your host, Pablo Hidalgo. I hope you have a great first day of celebration. Um, who here are four-day badge holders? Look at that. So you guys definitely know how to make the most of a celebration. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I know you guys are all Expanded Universe fans, and the behind-the-scenes stage is actually the place for a lot of that kind of, uh, of exploration of the Expanded Universe to happen. So. Uh, in addition to what you're about to see on Friday, I want to remind you at 10.30 a.m. we are going to have many uh, uh, novelists on stage along with editors from Del Rey uh, in the What's Coming from Del Rey panel. So Aaron Alston will be here, uh, Troy Denning, Drew Carpitian, James Lucino, and of course Tim Zahn will be part of that panel as well. On, uh, also tomorrow on Friday at 7.30 p.m. I ask all of you to come for my special uh, tribute to Brian Daly. Uh, James Lucino and myself are going to take a look at Daly's contributions to the early expanded universe um, in the forms of his, uh, his trilogy of Han Solo novels, which are, are my favorites, and um, his radio drama work. So, and there's, there's some interesting discoveries that we made about the early expanded universe um, that we hope to share on that panel. Also on Sunday, from 1.30 to 2.30, um, Jason Fry and myself will uh, be panelists talking about our respective essential guides. Um, so I ask you to come uh, to that one as well. But the reason you're here is because um, more than 20 years ago, the characters of Mara Jade, Grand Admiral Thrawn, and Talon Card basically entered the Star Wars universe um, as a result of uh, our guest's uh, work. And it's hard to believe that it's been almost 20 years since he kick-started the expanded universe uh, into what it's now become. And he's still an active contributor to it, including uh, penning the, um, excuse me, penning the uh, much anticipated novel Scoundrels, which will be coming out later this year. Um, my thought for this panel is, uh, as a byproduct of, of working on The Essential Reader, I, I took a look at all his Star Wars works that he's done. And, and it occurs to me that many have been celebrated, many have been examined, but there's a lot that may have fallen through uh, by the wayside and haven't had that kind of examination and discussion. So. I'm hoping to present all of them to, to Tim and see if they stir any memories. Um, and also just as, as fans to see whether or not you guys have read all of the, of the works out there that, that you could have. So without further ado, um, please join me in welcoming author Timothy Zahn. The last movie was 83, this is 91 that Eric came out, and um, Bantam had started the whole procedure. Uh, Lou Aronica had pushed this whole thing through. Uh, Lucasfilm had been thinking about restarting the adult Star Wars fiction line, but they hadn't gone very far with it, or there were still preliminary discussions when, when Lou's suggestion came in. Um, I was not privy to all the back vaccine stuff, but we were, we did uh, get to meet the uh, Bantam distributor for our area a few weeks before uh, the book came out, and uh, he was telling us that the original plan had been they wanted enough orders to print 100,000 hardcovers. They got enough orders to print 70,000. So even the bookstores had no idea whether Star Wars would sell or not. Um, on the flip side, about that same time, I went and talked to a class of, I think they were uh, five and six year old, uh, maybe six and seven year olds. It was a writing thing that some teacher asked me to come do. And I had a copy of the air cover. 
And um, I'm showing this to the kids, and they're saying, there's Han, there's Leia, there's Chewie. Um, okay, these kids weren't even born when the movie, when, when A New Hope first came out, but they know the characters because they're seeing them on the videotapes. Okay, there may be hope. <laughs> um, and, and you have to understand that Star Wars was considered a dead license because nothing was coming out and therefore there was no fandom. It's a chicken and egg situation. Uh, Bantam and Lucasfilm took the risk that 70,000 first printing was, was gone in about two weeks. Uh, my editor called and said we were going back for a 60,000 second printing. Called the next day to say, no, we're going to do two 30,000s because we, we can get them out to the bookstores faster that way. Uh, those of you who have a hardcover that's a brown, tan uh, uh, cover stock instead of the blue, that's because they ran out of the blue cover stock, so the fourth printing was on that tan. It caught everybody by surprise. By the time, I think, oh, probably within a, within a few weeks, Lucasfilm and Bantam had changed from, we'll do these three books to, let's do a contract for 12 more. <laughs> and it has only escalated since then. Last time I asked Shelley Shapiro for a number, she said it, there were somewhere around 150 adult Star Wars novels alone, not counting the children's, young adult, art books, making of, cross-sections and all of that. That's 150 novels. So, and that's basically the 20 years minus the, oh, you've got a, you've got a, a sheet of them right there. Um, and that's all, all in the last 20 years, except for the Brian Daly, the um, L. Neil Smith, and uh, the yeah, Alan D. L. Foster, Foster novelizations. Yeah. So, um, from nobody knowing whether anybody cared about Star Wars, we have come all the way to Celebration 6 and beyond. <laughs> The thing that strikes me about the original trilogy here, the, the Thrawn trilogy, as it's now come to be known, it, it didn't have that moniker at the start, but um, each book came out staggered by a year apart, which right. is not the, the publishing program has accelerated to a point where that seems like such a luxury. Mm -hmm. Is this trilogy something you could have written now under the, the, the pace of, of publishing that happens in the Star Wars world today? Well, I think the main reason you're bringing the books out faster is you've got umpteen authors doing them. Mm -hmm. So you only got a given author doing maybe two a year rather than one a year, but you've got several authors working at a given time so you can bring out your uh, you know, nine book series faster than nine years. Um, it would be difficult to do the Thrawn trilogy now, partly because you know, I had a clean white canvas because nobody had ever been allowed to write past Empire Strikes, or, or Return of the Jedi. So I didn't have to worry about running into something somebody else was doing or had done or stepping on somebody else's toes or worse, contradicting something somebody else is writing the same time I am, which, is, which has always been a problem when you've got multiple people doing things. And of course, add in the complication of the comic books. When the Thrawn trilogy came out, um, Dark, For uh, Dark Horse was doing the, was it the new? Uh, Dark Empire Dark series. Empire series yeah. Simultaneously, so we had to kind of keep an eye on making sure we weren't running into each other. I think theirs was a couple of years past the trilogy, so that helped. By the way, it's called, if you, if you I don't know if it's on the paperbacks, but on the, uh, the hardcovers, it was a, book whatever of a three book cycle, that's because Lucasfilm wouldn't let Bantam use the word trilogy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I mean, it wasn't labeled anything like the Thrawn trilogy, it was just these three books for the same reason World War I was just called the Great War until World War II came along. Uh, there was no reason to distinguish it from anything else because this was all there was, and as far as anybody knew, this was going to be all there was. It was, it was a gamble, and um, it could easily have you know, died on the vine, in which case this would probably be a Buffy or a Firefly convention or something. <laughs> <laughs> so as a, as a treat, and you saw a little bit of this earlier because my thumb slipped, but as a treat, we also will be showcasing some never-before-seen art from the forthcoming uh, new, uh, Essential Reader's Companion um, that come from, from Tim's books. Uh, this is the duel. Oh, I like that. Yeah, <laughs> this is the duel of, of Luke and the clone Luke. And one of the things I wanted to ask you is, uh, we have talked about. I, I've read interviews and I've heard you speak about, you know, uh, early concepts as it pertained to the first book that Jorus Sabaoth was an Obi Wan clone that the Nogri were at one point 
the Sith incarnation, but we never really get into the origins and, and concepts of the later books in, in, the, in the cycle. So the idea of Luke fighting a clone Luke, was that something that was in the story from the start, or, or how did that come from? No, that was, that was always, uh, always in the original outline. The, I, the, the process was, I did a, about a 10-page outline for Air, and then oh, two or three pages for the other two books, just to give the editor at Lucasfilm an idea of where I wanted to take it. After I finish Air, I don't follow the outline exactly because I always come up with ideas that are better than what I was thinking at the time. So things get changed, things get adapted. Um, Garmbel Iblis, for example, was, wasn't in my original outline. He came about because I, as I started Dark Force Rising, I realized Han didn't have a lot to do. And you gotta give Han something to do. So I came up with that character and he wound up then continuing on to the next, uh, next book and, and occasionally beyond. Um, yeah, it, it kind of developed along the way. There was always going to be the clones. I, I was not really happy about the idea of clones because it's too easy to cheat. Ah, you've actually killed my clone. Uh, it, it starts coming a little comic book. However, since Lucas had mentioned the Clone Wars, we were stuck with it. There, there, there are going to be clones. Thrawn is obviously going to use the technology if he can get it. The, the idea of using clones and, and under the uh, Asalamiri influence to grow them faster um, seemed, again, something that made sense with the Force and with Thrawn and clones in general. So um, having a clone of Luke was just kind of an obvious, obvious direction to go. And of course, because you can't see his outfit in the book like you could in a picture like this, I had to make the name distinctive, hence the Luke, the double vowel. Otherwise, you have no idea who I'm talking about at the time. So the, uh, the original three book cycle was next followed by a short story that appeared in uh, the Star Wars Adventure Journal number one called First Contact, which featured the first meeting of Talon Card and Mara Jade. Um, I'm looking at a piece of Mike Filardi art here depicting Talon, and one of the things, Talon's early explorations really had him being a dapper gentleman with a, with a really, you know, pencil mustache and, and, and very stylish. And then later, the, the comics version had him be a little bit more rugged, including a, an incarnation that you depicted in a card game. Yes. In, in your mind's eye, where does, where does Talon fall in that kind of scoundrel spectrum? Probably more in this picture than the later with the long hair and the, and the more rugged. Any of you uh, fans, it, it, this is going to date everybody, fans of Blake Seven? Yes. Anybody yeah. heard of Blake Seven? <laughs> <laughs> Got a few hands. Right? Okay. For those of you, my, the voice I heard when I wrote Card's lines was that of Avon. That'll mean nothing to most of you. He was a, a fairly dapper criminal who considered himself a bit above the rest of the, the, the crew in Blake Seven. Um, and that was kind of the, the image I had of, of Card. Um, I don't have any control over the images people use, um, how they change things around. The six foot tall Nogri were a bit much. We won't discuss that unless you insist. <laughs> I don't. Um, Understand that everything we write in Star Wars is owned by Lucasfilm, and they can take and do with it anything they want to. So if they want to give Dark Horse permission to make Nogri look like the Hulk, they can do that. Um, we hope they don't. If they want to change how a character looks, that's their option as well. So, uh, you know, it, it's sort of like um, if Mara or Card or Thrawn or Belt Iblis gets mentioned anywhere, I count it as a win, even if it's not exactly the way I would have done it. Because it's something I've done that's had an influence on Star Wars, whether people like it or not. <laughs> so this first adventure journal began a, a stint of collaboration with the publisher of the role-playing game license at the time, West End Games. Um, and that resulted in your involvement in the development of the Dark Striker campaign, mm -hmm. some of which had material some, that, that surfaced in some of your later books. Right. So uh, can you talk about the start of that project? They were going to do a box set of Star Wars adventures. They gave me some idea of the characters and where it was going to go and asked me to do a short story that would be lead into the campaign and then would feed me the game supplements as they went on. Uh, and as Paulo said, I would take, I took some of that material and used it in the uh, Spectre of the Past Vision of the Future as well, just kind of linked into to what they, they were doing. Uh, just as a side note, 
When I first started uh, the Thrawn trilogy, I was told to coordinate with the West End Games material, and they you know, sent me a stack about this thick of the game modules, the uh, source books, etc. And I groused about that for about 20 minutes, and then started actually looking at it, and found out they'd done a really good job. And I wound up adapting or adopting ship designs, aliens, uh, occasional characters, most, mostly background stuff, so I wasn't reinventing the wheel every time I needed a new ground vehicle. And I found out later on, it wasn't you know, anything I did on purpose, but I found out later on that the gamers were very pleased that I had used stuff that they'd been playing in the role-playing game in the novels. It sort of legitimized what they were doing, you know, it, it kind of, they were no longer at the children's table, they were getting to go to the adult table now. <laughs> so uh, that was kind of a, a unexpected but very nice side effect to be able to kind of link the games in and you know, occasional comics and uh, I mentioned a couple of things from Star Tours in uh, the, the Hand of Thrawn duology. The Star Tours people were very happy about that. Um, I found out later on that I really probably shouldn't have done that because Disney owned part of Star Tours and Disney is not noted for their sense of humor. <laughs> um, but nobody, nobody ever complained to me about it so I'm not even sure they ever knew so don't tell them. <laughs> So, time-wise, this brings us to the summer of 1995, and we had another follow-up short story, this time in Adventure Journal number 7, and here's a new piece of art, which represents Thrawn's, possibly his first encounter with the Empire, or at least he's, he's now entered the Imperial fold after running a bunch of Imperials in circles. Um, at this point, this was your first real attempt to fill in some of Thrawn's backstory. How much did you know when you were, when you were telling this particular story? I, I make it a rule not to fill in any background or maps unless I need it, just so I won't set up something that I, I suddenly realize I have a better idea, but it's too late, it's already set. Uh, so I had a little bit of idea of what was happening with Thrawn by now. Um, I'm working on Spectre and Vision at this point, so I know more about the backstory, I know why he was kicked out of the, of the Chiss um, uh, region of space. So I was just, I, I had basic ideas, and as you say, I'm just starting to fill in some of the details. And uh, I'm getting a copy of this book, right? Yeah, I'm sure we can arrange sure. that. Uh, well, I want to call out that this artwork is by Darren Tan. The previous artwork was by Jeff Carlisle and Chris Scalf. Um, this story also represented you collaborating with Mike Stackpole because he had shared character, this, this yeah. uh, Mosh Barris, who appears here as a young man, and then you see him washed up 25 years later in another short story. Um, well, but by Mike in that Yeah, book. actually, uh, Booster Tarek's first appearance That's is here right. as well. Yeah. Uh, Mike has complained, I've gotten to use two of his characters before he has. <laughs> <laughs> because we've collaborated, we've gotten some ideas, and then mine happened to come out before his. So this, and I think Hal Horn was uh, the other character I got to do first. <laughs> so on the subject of short stories, the next one is, I'm guessing, one that a lot of you have read, which appeared in Tales from the Moss Eyes and Cantina which is uh, the tale of the Tamika sisters uh, called Hammer Tom. Um, when they, Kevin J. Anderson served as editor on this, did you get any say as to the characters that you got to, uh, to work on from the cantina, from the cantina of Sarlin? We basically were asked to pick somebody and write about them. The problem with the, the Tanaka sisters, or Tanaka sisters, however you want to pronounce it, is that their backstory had already been done in the, in, uh, by West End Games. So I, I uh, did a little twist on that, and these are two of the uh, Mistral Shadow uh, Warriors masquerading as the sisters, which is why the title is Tale of the, quote, Tanaka Sisters. And by doing so, you actually helped solve a continuity error, and I, I don't know if that was part of your, your process, but uh, the notion that they're completely indistinguishable twins came from West End Games, a, a source book called Galaxy Guide One A New Hope, where they had a piece of artwork where they look exactly the same. But you can tell that they took some liberties because here they are. That's the artwork that appeared. Yeah, they're indistinguishable. And there's a photo that the art was based on. And they're clearly not indistinguishable. So. Well, I based it on the movies where, again, the brief shot you got of them, right, they are definitely not twins. So that, that's another example of a collaborative process helping solve what could have been a mistake. And now this whole thing's been planned all along, of course, right? Yes. Um, Next short story appears in Tales from Jabba's Palace, and I imagine it was a no-brainer as to which character you were going to select to, to tell from, from yeah, that thanks. assortment. Yeah, very, very obvious. Uh, this is artwork by Chris Trevis. Um, one of the things that 
and I don't know how much you were exposed to this, but in, in, in any fans from the early 90s know that there was a persistent rumor that Mara was actually, she's visible somewhere in Return of the Jedi, if you look carefully. And I, and I don't know how, how often you had to feel that kind of question. Occasionally, I watched very carefully. There was nobody in the movie I could see that could possibly be Mara. On the other hand, she's not going to be in the limelight anyway. She's going to be staying to the edges, so easily explained. Yeah, she's just off camera. <laughs> she's there, she's just off camera. <laughs> One of the things while working on The Essential Reader that I came across, and I make mention of it in this book, is um, I think the outline of this one established a very strong, well, Last Command had it, but this one really depicted a very strong telepathic connection between Mara and the Emperor, which was a level of force communication that is not the existence of films, really. Well, yeah, I mean, you can argue that back and forth. I think it was, it was either this book or what, or a story or one of the later ones where uh, Sue Rossoni said, we can't have this kind of telepathic communication. We, I mean, it's, it, telepathy is not a force power per se in the way you're doing it. And I, I they said it's more like senses, you know, Leia saying, I know where Luke is and em, at the end of Empire. And I would counter with, uh, use the force, Luke, trust your feelings. And they said, okay, well, you can use a few words. And I said, well, can you use a few words several times in a row? <laughs> she didn't like that idea. We finally settled that Mara and the Emperor had a unique communication link that we could not use with anybody else. So we got around it that way. But yeah, that was a problem. I mean, I could point to the movies and say, well, you're being inconsistent. Well, okay, but uh, we're going to try to be consistent from now on. And that uh, discussion actually surfaced, and this is what the research I found, it, it did end up being in a memo that went to George, and, and George okayed it. it. It was just presented as a yes or no question, could Mara do X? And he was fine with it, so it goes to show that at that time, that was the level of communication, and stuff that had to be vetted in the process. So. Bear in mind, I never knew any of that. <laughs> so here we go. Yeah, I'm revealing, revealing information. I, I should not get nearly as much background as, as some other privileged people do. <laughs> so next up, another short story, uh, Adventure Journal number 11, a Command Decision, which I think really put Thrawn in an Imperial's officer's uniform and the reaction to the other officers to him. Mm -hmm. um, anything Again, more us? backstory, more him setting up the conditions he needs to win against whoever his opponent is at the moment. And at the same time, doing a little bit of testing of the officers. As you're saying, as you say, there's ambivalent feelings, not only because he's an alien, but also because he apparently has lost the political battle at the Imperial Court and gotten kicked out to the unknown regions. And those of us who are with him are obviously being punished for something we didn't do. There go our careers, there go our lives. Why are we having to suffer through this guy's incompetence? all the while not realizing that there's something going on beneath the surface between Thrawn and the Emperor that's, no, he's not out of disfavor at all. He's doing something that nobody else can do. And one of the things, the, the impression that I got from this story when it came out, at least my, for me, it was this eye-opening idea of, my goodness, there's, this, there's years and years of Thrawn activity out in the unknown, uncharted realms of the galaxy that could be mined for storytelling potential. Yeah. And, you, and again, for continuity's sake, you have to explain why he's not in the original trilogy. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't somebody this competent be brought back to replace, you know, uh, you know uh, Admiral Ozzel, for example? Well, because he's busy elsewhere, and I had to make it something that was seriously important. Also bearing in mind, the Emperor doesn't think he needs Thrawn's help. We're going to wipe out the rebels here at Endor and be done with it. Uh, other thing about this story that I wanted to thank you for is the, the couple of short stories that I got published in the journal happened to appear in issues that featured your, uh, your, your story, so I'd like to think that more people had exposure to possibly even reading them because of that, so thank you. Um, next up, another Adventure Journal installment, a two-parter, well it's actually a four-parter, but uh, you and Mike uh, Stackpole collaborated on the side trip, uh, which was a story of, of, of Thrawn, kind of going undercover and it features Korn and, and Hal Horn. Um, but yeah, how did you divide that work? Because you took part one and part four. Right. What we decided to do when Mike and I first decided we were going to try this sort of thing is we discussed the story, got the basics of it, then I wrote a, a fairly complete outline for part one that I would do, a very brief outline 
for his parts two and three, basically just saying where I needed him to get me, and then a more complete outline for part four, so he would know where he was aiming. Why we did it as one, one and four and two and three, it just seemed like the, the logical thing to do at the time. And uh, th those are the closest things to real collaborations I've ever done. Uh, and they're kind of pseudo-collaborations because we're not writing the same stuff, we're just writing different parts of, of a continuing story. We did one more of those later on in yes, the slides. Uh, but before we leave side trip, was, you've seen a, a, a black and white sketch version of this art. Here's the full color art by Chris Trevis of Thrawn in Jodo Cast's armor. And I'm hoping someone from Hasbro sees this because it would make a, an easy to make action figure, I think. So, um, so this moves us. Yeah, we're, we're in about 97 hereabouts when, when the Star Wars resurgence is pretty much at full tilt. And from 97 to 98 brought us. Uh, the Hand of Thrawn duology. Now, uh, I'd like you to, to check my, my history on this. From what I understand, as you said, when the success of the first three-book cycle came out, it was decided, well, we're going to do 12 books. And I think it was a foregone conclusion that the 12th book would be yours. Um, or at least at some point it was decided. Yeah, I don't know if it was foregone at the beginning, but that's how it was presented to me, I think about a year or so after I... Uh, Last Command came out, mm -hmm. that they wanted me to do the last book in the cycle. Um, I said, okay, this sounds great, uh, I've got room in my schedule, but I, there are two things I want to do if I'm going to do this book. One is I want to end the war with the Empire, it's you know, 15 years after Endor, it's time we end the war and move on to other, other story ideas. And secondly, I want to get Luke and Mara Jade together. Uh, they said, fine, on the first one. But on the second one, we want their relationship to remain, I think the word they used was ambiguous or something along that line. And I said, okay, well, if I can't do that, I'm really not interested in doing the book, thanks. I uh, uh, hope you can find somebody else. It was not a threat or an ultimatum, it was simply, well, I'm not gonna do, really don't want to do the book in that case, but thank you for, thank you for playing or something. Uh, oh, about two weeks or so later, I think they came back and went, all right, fine, you can do it. <laughs> I have no idea what happened in the discussion those two weeks. I'm not sure I want to. Um, but originally it was scheduled to be one book. Uh, and I was getting to the, oh, 70, 80,000 word. It, it, typical book's about 100,000 words for me. I'm at the 70 or 80,000 word mark inspector, and I'm about a quarter of the way through my outline. And I'm realizing I am in deep trouble. There's a lot more story here than I realized. And about the time I'm starting to panic, George announced he was postponing the prequel movies by a year, which means Bantam has another year with the books to fill. So I called my editor and said, you know, if we wanted to split um, Hand of Thrawn into two books, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> he, fell, he fell for it. <laughs> And so we wrote, in a, we wrote a, a contract for the second book. Well, we needed new names now. We couldn't have The Hand of Thrawn as a single book. Now we needed two titles. And we came up with Spectre of the Past and Vision of the Future. And uh, interestingly enough, Vision of the Future wound up being about 200 plus thousand words. So it's actually, in, in many ways, it's a trilogy in two volumes. So uh, for a while I was convinced the only Star Wars I could do were trilogies, whether I wanted to or not. <laughs> And the implication, and I know a lot of you know this, but it's just interesting to, to restate that with, with Tim knowing that Mara and Luke would end up together at the end, all the relationships that Luke entered into in the interim.